Early in the playlist, we saw that operating systems have four managers. They have the process manager, the device manager, the memory manager, and the file manager. These are the four essential managers of every operating system. We have seen that each manager works closely with other managers, and each manager performs its own unique role. We were also introduced to the notion that the user interface is where the user issues commands to the operating system. And we showed the user interface as sitting on top of all of these managers. So if you've been following the videos within this playlist, you should now be familiar with the following diagrams. This one here was a recommendation for the view of the underlying hardware that the operating system is responsible for controlling. This here illustrated all of the managers that we have within all operating systems. And this diagram showed how all of the individual managers communicate with one another to help perform the tasks of a typical operating system. A network was not always an integral part of an operating system. Early operating systems were self-contained with network capability added on top of the operating system. Many modern operating systems now have a network manager, in addition to the managers we've already looked at. So we could say that modern operating systems have five managers. So the managers we actually have when we're dealing with operating systems are shown here. The process manager, memory manager, device manager, and file manager. And we've already said that these cooperate with each other. Now we've now got this fifth manager referred to as the network manager and it sits here and actually is responsible for communication between all of the computers using appropriate protocols etc and this network manager will actually cooperate with all of the other managers as I'm trying to illustrate here by the black lines that have just appeared let's consider a scenario for how the network manager could be cooperating with all of the other managers that form part of the operating system well let's say that the process manager is currently allowing a process to execute Execute. And in the computer's memory, we have that particular application that contains the process that the process manager is allowing to take place. However, the application is so large that it's not all in the main memory. And furthermore, it's not on the local disk. It is actually stored somewhere else on the network. And we'll say for argument's sake, it's stored on a server. Now, it's important now that once we get to realize that the next machine code instruction is not in memory, we have to go and locate it. And if it's elsewhere on the system, not on the local disk for the computer which is actually currently running the process, then the network manager would have to be involved because we would have to go to a distant computer on our network and get the rest of the machine code to bring that ultimately into the memory. Now it might first of all have to be put on the local disk, in which case the file manager would have to be involved there. So we can see a situation whereby the network manager would have to to work with the memory manager and the file manager to allow us to go and get the rest of the application, the rest of the machine code that's going to be run, which is not held locally on the computer we're possibly currently working on. Now that's just one example, it's a pretty crude one at this stage, but here we can see that we now have all of the managers that are regarded as being part of modern operating systems. What I want to go on to in a moment is to look at what are the essential things that all of these managers have to do. They all all have common tasks, generic tasks, and we're going to have a look at what they are in a moment. Each operating system manager must perform the following tasks. That is, each manager, regardless of which one, have the following responsibilities for the hardware that they're actually controlling and the software that they're actually responsible for controlling as well. Now, each manager has the responsibility to monitor its resources continually. Let's just take one of the managers at random. We'll discuss the memory manager. The memory manager will be responsible for the random access memory and it will know which parts of that particular memory are used, in other words have applications are stored in them ready to run, and also it must know where the free space is. And of course as time goes on, some applications are brought in, some applications are taken out of this particular memory, and the operating system is responsible for monitoring this. And each manager must be responsible for monitoring its own resources, the resources that it is responsible for. 
If we now take the device manager, for example, let's say we have a situation whereby a particular device is being used by a process and maybe another process wants to use it. Well, the device manager monitors it and says, well, actually, nobody else can use it at the moment because it's being used by another process. So it's responsible for monitoring this, deciding which one of its devices is being used and which one is free to be used by something else. So that's what we mean by monitoring its resources continually. Each manager also has a responsibility to enforce policies that determine who gets what, when they get it, and how much they get. And what we're talking about here are the resources. Who gets the resource, when do they get it, and how much of the resource do they actually get. Let's use the process manager to discuss this enforcement of policies by a particular manager. And let's say we have process A running on the central processing unit and it is having its machine code fetch, decoded and executed. And two more processes are waiting in the wings. One is process B and one is process C. Now which one of those is going to get the processor time next? Who gets what in other words? When will they get it? When will the current process A stop executing? And when process B and C actually are given access to the central processing unit time, so their machine code can be fetched, decoded, and executed, how much time will they actually be given? How much of the resource, which is the time, will they be give, given to run on the central processing unit? So those are some of the examples of what we mean by who gets what, when they get it, and how much. So let's just say that we have process B and process C waiting. And process C has a higher priority than both process A and process B. So what will happen? A policy will say to process A, I have got something with a very high priority here, which is process C. I'm going to allow that one to have access to the CPU next. Now a policy has to be in place to allow that to happen, to allow C to be given the resource of the central processing unit before process B, because C has a higher priority than process B. Also, if it's a very high priority, it will tell process A, which is currently running, and when I say it, the operating system manager will tell process A to stop executing and allow process C to execute. And these are the kinds of policies that exist within operating systems. And of course, these policies are implemented by computer programs because the operating system is really a computer program. Another important task to be carried out by an operating system manager is to allocate the resources when appropriate, i.e. when they're needed. So a process could be executing and it may want to print off a particular file. So the device manager will simply allocate that resource to the process to allow that file to be printed. We might have a situation where the process manager will allocate some CPU time as appropriate when a process has been chosen to be executed. It says you can now have the resource of the central processing unit because you now need to run. Another important task that has to be carried out by each operating system manager is to deallocate the resources when appropriate. If we take a situation where random access memory has stored within it a number of applications and one of the applications has just been exited by the user, then what the memory manager needs to do is to actually remove from the random access memory the machine code for that particular application. In other words, to deallocate the resources and it needs to do that to free up the memory to allow other applications to be brought in so they can have their turn to actually execute within the computer system. Another example is as soon as a printer has been finished with by a process then the printer would be freed up, the resource of the printer would be freed up by the device manager. So what we're looking at here are the four key tasks that every operating system manager must perform. It must monitor its resources continually, it enforces policies that determine who gets what, when they get them and how much they get and we're talking about who gets what resource when they get that resource and how much of the resource they get they must allocate the resources when appropriate 
and they then must deallocate the resources to allow them to be used again by something else. So these are the four key features, the key tasks that have to be carried out by every operating system managers. In other words, these are the generic tasks. Check out the supporting website for these videos and consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and you'll get an automatic update every time I upload a new video.